You are listening to Everyday Evidence, presented by the American Occupational Therapy Association, helping the occupational therapy practitioner apply evidence to practice. Here's your host, Matt Brandenburg. On today's episode, we are joined by Dr. Liz Griffin Lanigan, who is adjunct faculty at the University of New Hampshire, the chairperson of the American Occupational Therapy Association's Mental Health Special Interest Section, and a member of the AOTA Commission on Practice. She has extensive experience in mental health practice. Thank you so much for being on the show today, Liz. I'm glad to be here. Today, we want to speak with you about the OT practice guidelines for adults living with serious mental illness and a recent AOTA member appreciation webinar you gave, which was titled Applying Evidence for Best Practices in Mental Health Settings. So to start off, Liz, what motivated you to enter into mental health practice? Well, it certainly wasn't an area that I was considering as I was doing my basic professional education. But during the time I was a student, I had an opportunity to serve in a small community mental health program. There I had an opportunity to observe an OT serving as part of a mental health team. I felt a strong connection to the personalized relationship that these team members formed with their clients. This was long before OT developed language for client-centered care, but this team's intimate relationships with clients to help them to be part of their community struck a real chord with me. This client-centered care in mental health has served as a foundation for me in providing services to both inpatient and community mental health settings. Awesome. Thank you so much. I I really love that interpersonal connection and how much that's emphasized in occupational therapy. I I can relate. I think that's what has really motivated me to, to enter into this field and begin a budding career as an occupational therapist. It certainly is important to what we do in all practice areas, and it certainly is critical in mental health settings. Absolutely. And Liz, as as you know, this podcast is focused on evidence, evidence-based practice, and, and how to translate it into practice. Why do you feel it is so important to generate and apply evidence within mental health practice? All right. That's a wonderful question. Throughout my mental health practice, I've consistently attempted to implement theory-based interventions. I learned about effective interventions from my experiences while providing interventions and from experiences of colleagues. But the missing part of intervention planning for many years was having knowledge of demonstrated effectiveness that comes from intervention research findings. As opposed to my relying on trial and error learning to achieve successful services. Our clients deserve to receive effective interventions, and that knowledge comes from implementation of evidence based interventions. The OT profession needs to generate and apply evidence for effective interventions, first for our clients and second, to demonstrate OT's distinct value in mental health to our clinical colleagues and to the policymakers and funding sources that we need in order to provide services to clients living with mental health challenges. I like how you touch on that, that last part of how important it is to use evidence in mental health setting as I feel like a lot of these practice settings are, are still emerging. So it's important to, to be able to use evidence and evidence-based interventions to show OT's effectiveness and therefore secure funding. Is that an accurate thought that I have? Absolutely. And you know, we certainly need to generate a much larger body of knowledge and evidence in mental health. We do in all practice settings in occupational therapy. But if we're talking about mental health settings today, we absolutely need to generate more evidence for the interventions. From our professional experience, we have knowledge of interventions that we've seen be effective for clients, Um, but we need to be able to document it and then be able to use that as we explain the rationale for including occupational therapy and mental health services and support that we can achieve in desired outcomes. 
Absolutely. And I, I really think the OT practice guidelines for adults living with serious mental illness are a great resource for evidence-based practice. And so I want to dive into to those a little bit. Um, but before we do, I'd like to ask if you could give us an overview of what serious mental illness encompasses. So for individuals experiencing diagnosed mental illness, there are two categories that are described by SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. There is the category of any patient or any person, I should say, who has a diagnosed mental illness. And then there is sort of a subcategory of those who live with serious mental illness. So SAMHSA defines serious mental illness as a diagnosable mental, behavioral, or emotional disorder that causes serious functional impairment. It continues that substantially interferes with or limits one or more major life activities. So SAMHSA defines serious mental illness as including diagnoses of major depression, schizophrenia, and bipolar disorders, and any other mental disorders that cause serious impairment. The National Institute of Mental Health provides additional information to explain that serious mental illness typically involves three characteristics of the experience of having mental illness. First, having the diagnosis. Second, that the person experiences functional impairment. And third, the duration of the illness. So people who have very acute or short episodes of mental illness would not necessarily fit within the category of serious mental illness. But if the duration creates a situation in which the person is enduring long episodes or long experiences with mental illness and have functional impairment, then that person is going to fit within the category of serious mental illness. So I'll finish with the role of OT for persons living with serious mental illness is to support these persons to reach their full potential for community participation by providing occupation-based interventions to enhance the life of the person as a member of society. Thank you. I absolutely love that definition of, of OT's role in, in working with this population. And I want to ask you about, I guess, two more buzzwords, I guess we can refer to them as, that, that we generally hear when discussing uh, serious mental illness and, and OT's role within this population. And those are mental health and behavioral health. Could you maybe help to clarify the difference between mental health and behavioral health? Okay, so I'll start with saying that there are places in the literature or in our conversations and discussions where the terms mental health and behavioral health are used interchangeably. We had the term mental health and clients living with mental health challenges for many years. More recently, the term behavioral health has been used to enlarge the scope, to include children with emotional challenges, to include people who are living with substance abuse problems, which fit within mental illness, but were seen as separate. And so the term behavioral health was introduced to encompass a larger group of people who could all benefit from mental health services. There are some challenges in having these terms is interchangeable. We need to respect the expertise that clinicians of all disciplines have developed over time in specialized areas. And so it's important not to lose the idea of mental health services for some of the specialized mental health challenges or the specialized mental health systems. So I'm glad that behavioral health is used as a term that's more encompassing, but I think in healthcare, we need to understand that we need clarity and that there's the potential for using both terms in ways that could cause confusion. And, and so I guess 
I want to end by saying I want to advocate for every person in society who can benefit from services to address any kind of psychosocial or psychiatric problem, and that includes emotional disturbances in children. It includes the entire age span, and it includes all the variations of diagnosed mental illness or substance abuse problems. Thank you very much for clarifying that that difference. And w- would you say OT is, is well equipped to address mental health and behavioral health in patients that we may work with? Absolutely. You know, in the basic professional education that we all go through, we need to understand psychosocial approaches to client care and mental health approaches to client care. The designated setting where OT practitioners work in does not include or exclude providing psychosocial or mental health services, but we as practitioners across all settings need to understand the capacity that we each have to provide psychosocial and mental health services and to collaborate with others with more extensive experience in mental health services when it's appropriate. So I like the idea of calling the recipient of our services clients or or members of society. Certainly in many inpatient situations, people are still referred to as patients. And I understand that. But I think when we're dealing with people who experience any kind of mental health challenge, one of the critical pieces is to respect them as individuals. And so even in inpatient settings, I like to use more generic terms and get away from labels. I like that. I like that a lot. That's a, a very clear and, and succinct way to look at the the debate we all hear about in referring to people we work with as patients or clients. And I really like that explanation. Thank you. I think now the, the stage is set, Liz. Can you talk to us about the practice guidelines? How is this publication really organized and, and how would you recommend that practitioners use it? Certainly. So the Occupational Therapy Practice Guidelines for Adults Living with Serious Mental Illness were developed in multiple phases, all supported by AOTA's Evidence-Based Projects Department. The initial step was identification of a team of practitioners and scholars to define what questions should be asked about evidence for occupation-based practice and mental health. These individuals in, in the team generated five questions for conducting systematic reviews of current intervention research findings. The five questions were then assigned teams and they produced analysis of current evidence for interventions. Within these analysis, they identified themes for evidence-based interventions for occupations. These teams then authored critically appraised topic papers, or CATs, for each theme. So each of the five questions had approximately four or five themes, and there is a CAT paper for each one. These can be found on the AOTA website under evidence-based practice in mental health, and they're available to the members. Then these teams, for each of the five questions, developed AJOT articles to report the analysis of evidence-based interventions. The next step was Dr. Susan Noyes and I were asked to co-author the OT practice guidelines for adults living with serious mental illness for AOTA. So the organization of the guidelines, they begin with an overview describing adults living with serious mental illness and the approaches for OT interventions broadly. Next, each of the five systematic review questions was written up in a chapter to report the findings from these systematic reviews for occupation-based interventions. In each of these five chapters, Dr. Norris and I extended this knowledge into applications for practice. 
so that practitioners would have guidance for implementing effective occupation-based interventions. There are several other chapters um, that are important, but I would like to highlight that at the end of the guidelines, there are three cases in which the information is elaborated, taking the practitioners through the OT process of evaluation and intervention and linked into the intervention process are examples of implementing evidence-based intervention based on the findings that are reported in the practice guidelines. So for practitioners, my recommendation is to use the practice guidelines to review the themes of effective occupation-based intervention approaches for client needs across all occupation areas. The interventions are rated as having strong, moderate, or weak evidence. This is really important because the recommendation is to select either strong or moderate rated interventions within mental health practice. The point in the OT process where this occurs is once you've done the evaluation and you've collaborated with the clients on effective goals, the intervention planning step is the time to pull in information from effective interventions and make selections that match to the client's specific needs. I, I love the focus that you've had on translating the evidence into current practice and the supports that you provide to pra practitioners to do so with the case studies and different grades of, of strength of evidence. And I really want to go into more detail on those findings and those features of, of the practice guidelines specifically. Um, but before we jump into that, I want to ask you about a phrase that I've heard throughout my education and wanted to hear your thoughts on, which is the phrase, every patient is a mental health patient. How would you say that these practice guidelines that you've helped develop benefit practitioners, even if they aren't working in a typical mental health practice setting? Before I talk about using the practice guidelines outside of typical mental health settings, I'd like to sort of react to the phrase. I've spent the majority of my clinical practice advocating for the needs of individuals who live with mental health challenges. So I start by rephrasing that statement. When you say every patient is a mental health patient, I want to move into person-centered language to destigmatize those living with mental health challenges. And so my thoughts are that only some people in society lived with diagnosed mental illness. And OT offers critical intensive services for this group. But then there are others in society who are at risk for mental health challenges. And OT offers preventative services to provide clients with services to prevent them moving into having a diagnosed mental illness. And finally, all people in society benefit from OT services to promote and support mental health and wellness. So in looking at these three different clusters of people in society, I become troubled by saying every patient's a mental health patient because I really want to move away from identifying the term patient. Clients come into our OT world with single or cluster of health challenges, but defining them all as mental health patients, my fear is that sort of creates a stigma, and we certainly want to move away from that. So let's start with the idea that any client, whether it's in an outpatient setting or defined as a patient in an inpatient setting, any individual in which we engage with as OT practitioners can benefit from mental health or psychosocial approaches. And 
I feel that it's important as OT practitioners that it's our responsibility to be paying attention to the holistic needs of the individuals that come into our practice settings. And in doing so, we need to look at what are the psychosocial needs or mental health needs that will promote wellness regardless of the health condition of the client. So for practitioners who are not in designated mental health settings, an important use of the practice guidelines is to understand and provide interventions that do all of the things I just mentioned, that are aimed at promotion for those in the well community who need mental health and mental wellness, to be target the prevention of risk for developing mental illness diagnosis, and to provide interventions for those who live with diagnosed mental illness and need an intensive level of mental health services. The practice guidelines provide effective interventions that can be looked at across all three of those categories. For practitioners who are in non-mental health settings, It's important to recognize the needs of clients who need to benefit or have reason to benefit from intensive level mental health OT services. Practitioners in other settings may have a range of knowledge and skills. Some practitioners may be able to use effective interventions and provide the settings that clients with mental health challenges need in these non mental health settings. In other situations, these practitioners should call upon the OT practitioners who do have expertise, have the knowledge and skills in these intensive level mental health services to provide the services for these clients or to collaborate with the practitioner in the non-mental health setting to enable these services. And thus, The practice guidelines provide an important resource about knowledge and skill to practitioners outside of mental health settings to understand mental health challenges and to gain the knowledge for applying effective occupation-based interventions, regardless of the defined practice setting that OTs and OTAs are working in. Thank you, Liz. That's such a great explanation of of mental health practice. And uh, I, I appreciate you stating how psychosocial factors do affect everyone and, and can be addressed in all settings of OT practice. But it's still important to consider all the contextual and, and person factors impacting our clients. So we should exercise caution in, in using that phrase. We'll get back to our interview right after this quick message. You all know we really try to make research more consumable and applicable on everyday evidence. But did you know that just one minute of your time could help us to improve the show, improve the resources the American Occupational Therapy Association provides for practitioners, and improve the application of evidence to practice within our whole field? Please take our one-minute survey. It's only three questions, and you can find the link in this and every episode's description. And support the AOTA in continued efforts to improve our podcasts and to improve the translation of research to practice. Now back to the interview. Now, I I do want to dive back into uh, the results of those systematic reviews and how they were incorporated into the practice guidelines and ask you about interventions that are mentioned in the practice guidelines, which focus on supporting occupations. I understand the practice guideline is organized into three groups of occupations. ADLs and IADLs, rest and sleep, leisure and social participation is the first employment and education is the second, and then health and wellness promotion is the third uh, group of occupation that you found evidence in regards to intervention supporting each of those groups. So to start with that first group, what, what are the best supported interventions for people with severe mental illness to work on ADLs, IADLs, rest and sleep, 
leisure and social participation. So this systematic review question clustered five of the significant occupations. Obviously, play was not included because that typically is an occupation of children and youth. In these occupations, the interventions were looked at across these five areas of occupations, and the themes of effective interventions that were identified combine interventions that are both at the strong level of evidence and the moderate level of evidence. The three themes of interventions that are important to incorporate start with the first one being occupation-based interventions. These are the interventions in which OT practitioners are engaging clients in doing the actual occupations. And the practitioners are enabling the clients to expand or enhance their performance of these actual occupations. The second theme is entitled psychoeducation interventions. These are interventions um, that typically provide a brief educational component and then enable the clients to look at ineffective strategies of doing the occupation or ineffective strategies of thinking about the occupation and then practice in using the changes of better or improved strategies. A typical approach within psychoeducation interventions is cognitive behavioral therapy. What's important because CBT is an approach used by many disciplines is that we link the CBT approaches for changes of thinking strategies into enabling the client to make changes in occupational performance. That's the portion that makes us different from the way other disciplines may use CBT, and that's our distinct value. The third theme of interventions that found strong and moderate level evidence are skills training interventions. And in these, OT practitioners may be enabling clients to practice performance skills or other categories of of factors that affect occupational performance. So an example might be to practice social skills or to practice cognitive thinking skills that then would be used to support that person's performance in the actual occupation. Thank you so much, Liz. Before we uh, go into the second group of of occupations and and their interventions, I want to ask if you could maybe expound on one of those examples, maybe give a, a, a case example or a personal story about how you've seen one of those interventions uh, lead to a, a positive outcome. So a woman that I worked with many years ago was a woman who lived with persistent major depression. While she had some deficits in actual performance of occupations, she also had limitations in her confidence and her awareness that she had the capacity to perform these occupations. At the time in which I first engaged with her, she was remaining at home and doing very little. This was a woman in probably her late 40s, early 50s. Her children were adults or almost adults. She had not worked outside of the home after she was married. And her husband worked the night shift. So during the daytime when she was at home, she needed to be quiet to do the home maintenance activities that she was responsible for, but basically needed to keep the home environment quiet because that was an important time when her husband was sleeping. So I began with engaging her in performing some leisure occupations because my intention was to help her be more active. So in this case, I used examples from the theme of occupation-based interventions in which I was engaging her in the actual interventions. But then I combined it with 
psychoeducation interventions in which I help her look at her perspectives or her limited awareness of how she could engage in occupations. So in those settings, we talked about what occupation she wanted to begin to increase participation in and looked at what was limiting her. So in addition to the brief education or instructional information I provided her with in the CBT type psychoeducation interventions, we looked at what was holding her back, what thinking was getting in her way, and then how to implement more effective thinking strategies to help her have confidence to move into trying and um, participating in occupations. Um, So I hope that's an example that will explain combining some of these intervention types, but recognizing that the combination is what ultimately may meet an individual client's needs. Absolutely. Thank you so much for sharing that example and giving us a sneak peek into your own clinical reasoning and expert approach to intervention. Okay, let's let's dive in now to that second group of occupations, employment and education. So Liz, what are the best supported interventions for people with severe mental illness to engage in employment and education? So the team that did the systematic review on the topic of employment and education actually looked at them as two separate intervention areas. There is strong level of evidence for employment interventions. In fact, this is an area that has had a tremendous amount of research into intervention effectiveness. The gold standard of interventions is supportive employment. And the specific model that has the highest evidence for employment interventions is the individual placement and support model, which is known as IPS. This intervention approach is an intervention in which the client's interests are explored and then the client is placed directly into a competitive employment situation, real work, and then the intervention is done within the actual work setting. The variety of clinicians providing intervention then either do the training within the actual job site or they provide coaching outside of work hours. So the clinician might discuss with the client outside of work hours what aspects the client was having challenges with, talk with the client about strategies, and ask the client to then in the next work day or session to try out those new strategies. Individual placement and support has been widely researched, and it really is the gold standard. Hence, the rating of strong level of evidence for this employment intervention. I have to say that it's an area of research that I've conducted myself and as an occupational therapist um, think highly of this model. The struggle is there are very few occupational therapy practitioners in these programs. I see, and many other OT practitioners see a role for what OT services could add to complement the other disciplines in this model. But we need to collaborate as a group to introduce the benefit or distinct value of OT services and help identify that we would complement and not get in the way of the services already being provided. As much as it's important to know that this has very strong evidence, we need to find a way to have our profession integrated into this model. The second theme of interventions for employment are cognitive remediation training interventions, or CRT. 
these interventions typically are done at a computer, although there are paper and pencil sessions that are feasible also. Um, but the intervention has the client practicing different cognitive processes through a computer game type activity, the clients would be working on enhancing attention span, enhancing attention to detail, problem solving cognitive challenges or tasks. Some of the CRT interventions are done with only the computer-based exercise. Others are done in conjunction with discussion sessions that talk about how to assist the client to apply these enhanced cognitive processes in day-to-day living. Again, this is a situation where OT as a profession using CRT would do the discussion and maybe practice sessions in which we are linking the enhancement of cognitive processes to actual occupational performance. Now I'm going to talk about education. Perfect. Supported Education interventions have been developed by our own profession. Occupational therapy practitioners have identified the needs and the approaches within supportive education approaches or interventions. At this time, these interventions lack sufficient evidence. That is because there has been so few research studies conducted to generate evidence. So my plug in this area is this is an occupational therapy intervention. It has great support for clients who live with mental health challenges, who want to continue in formal and informal education, but we need to begin to conduct the research studies and generate evidence for this um, intervention type. Absolutely. Thank you for summarizing some of those best supported interventions. And I also really, really appreciate that call to action as a field and a, a specialty of mental health practice to to generate more evidence and, and really add to our profession as a whole, uh, which, as we've discussed earlier, is is essential to securing additional funding. That's a really important point about the OT profession needing to conduct research and generate evidence. Well, I highlighted it, especially for supportive education interventions, the bulk of the research studies and the findings of effectiveness of intervention types, the bulk of these studies have been conducted outside of the OT profession. Very, very few of the studies analyzed were initiated and conducted by the occupational therapy profession. So it's really important for our listeners to understand that we have an urgent need to be conducting research studies and looking at findings that provide evidence for effective interventions. Certainly this is a need for interventions for individuals living with serious mental illness, but it's a need across all practice areas in occupational therapy. A great way of doing this is to partner with local academic programs because there we can partner with people who have research expertise and engage clinicians who have the clients in their settings and can conduct the interventions in which the research studies are involved in. So that's really important. Absolutely. Uh, Thank you for that uh, encouragement and also instruction uh, to help listeners who may be interested in contributing research to know where to start and where to to look to, to gain those resources. I think now, Liz, let's let's go ahead and discuss that third group of occupations, health and wellness promotion, and what some of the best supported interventions uh, for people with severe mental illness are for this third group. Um, at the time that the systematic reviews were being done, we were still living with the Occupational Therapy Practice Framework 3. Since 
this systematic review into health and wellness promotion, we now have the OTPF4 with the added occupation of health management. So it's wonderful that we have a body of information about effective interventions already for this new occupation that we've identified within the occupational therapy profession. Within health and wellness promotion, there was strong evidence for all four themes of effective interventions. The four are physical health, relaxation, exercise, and weight loss. I'll start with physical health. This includes things like scheduling and arriving at all sorts of medical and clinical appointments, medication adherence, which includes acquiring or picking up of prescriptions and following the schedule of taking these prescription medications, including getting any lab tests or lab procedures. All of these things are really important so that the client is knowledgeable about one's own health status and taking better care of any health conditions. So occupational therapy interventions around physical health may look at things like communication skills. How do you call a a doctor's office and schedule an appointment? How do you make sure your prescription has been transferred to your local pharmacy or your mail order pharmacy service? How to understand the medical information that is being provided to you. So looking at health literacy. The next theme of relaxation, the two strong types of relaxation included progressive muscle relaxation and yoga. And so occupational therapy interventions in these two categories include both teaching these strategies and helping clients develop routines to engage in these strategies in ways that help their health and wellness. The same holds true for exercise interventions. Clients need to learn exercise procedures, but also need strategies for helping them create routines. In exercise strategies, the interventions may be as simple as creating walking routines, but it may also include learning and practicing exercise routines that address cardiovascular or more intensive exercise routines. And the last of the themes was weight loss. Critical in the weight loss theme was the issue of losing and maintaining weight loss, but also those strategies that help maintain current weight. So again, here is providing clients with interventions by OT practitioners to help them understand nutrition, food groups, calorie intake, and meal planning. OT has a tremendous amount to offer in terms of helping clients with meal planning and grocery shopping and actual meal preparation. So it's important to look at the outcomes of both weight loss or weight maintenance. And so as Matt asked me to talk about these three categories of occupations, but remember I said there were five systematic review questions that were asked. One that we're not talking about today is early intervention for psychosis. So these are individuals who have not been formally diagnosed with a mental illness and have not moved into the category of people who live with serious mental illness. But these are interventions that OT practitioners can carry out for those individuals who may have had a first episode of psychosis or are at high risk for psychosis. And the last systematic review is stigma. Stigma is critical for our clients to deal with um, if they're living with a serious mental illness, 
particularly this systematic review, looked at self-stigma. These are the internal beliefs that interfere with occupational performance because of the individual's acceptance of stigmatizing beliefs and internalizing those. So at this time, this is really an emerging area. And again, many more research investigations need to look at interventions to target self-stigma. The practice guidelines include information on it, um, and I encourage you to go and read this in this area and think about not only what do we do to offer interventions to help our clients with self-stigma, but what can we do to collaborate with other clinicians and disciplines to create um, and generate evidence for effective interventions for self-stigma. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for sharing these interventions and, and this additional information with us, Liz. I, I want to ask you a, a follow-up. Why are these factors so important to address in mental health occupational therapy practice? So as I said, the three significant occupation areas that now includes the new occupation of health management are our domain as occupational therapy practitioners. These are the areas in which we have great understanding of what it means to perform occupations and what does it mean to have occupational balance and engagement and participation in occupations. These are the ways that we can promote our distinct value. We can make a difference in the lives of people who live with serious mental illness. We can make a major difference in enhancing the community engagement. So our clients who live with serious mental illness can feel like they are contributing and engaging in society along with all of the other people in society, that they are sort of equal footing with all members of society. And that's really important. For the health and wellness promotion, for the new occupation of health management, it's very important to know that individuals living with serious mental illness experience health disparities when compared with the well population. Clients who live with serious mental illness continue to have a life expectancy that is 20 to 25 years shorter than the person living in the well population. And much of this has to do with the lack of attention to physical health. And so the need is for integrated physical health and mental health services. There's certainly a big push in healthcare right now to integrate physical and mental health services, but we've got a long way to go to making that happen. There are nice examples of OT services moving into primary care situations or into integrated physical health, mental health service programs. Um, And so that's really important. And in addressing all of this, the role of OT practitioners in primary care or other uh, physical health um, settings or integrated physical health, mental health settings is to help people enhance their engagement in chosen meaningful occupations that help individuals with serious mental illness reach quality of life and personal satisfaction. Ultimately, that's our objective as occupational therapy practitioners, regardless of who our clients are. Absolutely. I I couldn't agree with that overarching goal anymore. Liz, you recently gave an AOTA member appreciation webinar titled Applying Evidence for Best Practices in Mental Health Settings. Um, And I think in in talking about that a little bit, uh, you can also cover some some tips and advice on on how to apply these practice guidelines to practice to to touch on this important topic of applying evidence for best practices in mental health settings. Can you give us an overview of the process of applying evidence for best practice? Certainly. So let me start by saying that there are a number of resources 
beyond the actual practice guidelines that have been developed to help practitioners learn about the evidence and understand how to apply evidence-based practice. The information, the practice guidelines, and some of the publications focus on giving examples of individual clients or individual cases. The recent webinar that I provided to AOTA focused on program development and integrating evidence-based interventions from a programmatic point of view. When you have um, a setting, how do you design the overarching program in which your individual clients participate? And so for both, it's important to look at the process of applying evidence for best practice. Um, I stated earlier that the step of the OT process as explained by OTPF4 in which we consider evidence-based practice or effective interventions is in the intervention planning stage. We've done the evaluation, we've established the goals collaboratively with our clients so we know what their wishes and needs are. At that point, we need to look at what interventions are both effective and match the client's needs and desires. We can't just say there's a really effective program for enhancing relaxation or exercise and say, this is what we're going to use. We only use it when it matches the client's needs and desires. And so how do we determine what the client's needs and desires are. In the OT process at the individual client level, we do evaluations. And so all of us have a repertoire of evaluations that we use that are suited to the clients we serve. If we're looking at it from a program design for the setting, instead of individual evaluations, what we need to do is to conduct a needs assessment. And that's where we're understanding what are the variety and constellations of needs and desires that clients in our setting identify or voice. This is part of the overall program development process. And there is lots of literature on how to conduct program development both in OT textbooks and in journal publications. The needs assessment helps us understand that clients have general characteristics and needs. And then that's what we match to looking at the various examples of evidence-based effective interventions. And so if we're looking at it from a program point of view, we identify a variety of effective interventions and we have that knowledge so that when we're designing individual intervention plan or an intervention plan through group services, we have a repertoire of effective intervention types that we can pull from to make that match. And so AOTA has resources. Um, certainly starting with the critically appraised topic papers, so those CAT papers that I mentioned the, that's available to members on the AOTA website. All of the five systematic review questions um, have CAT papers. Um, and then acquire the practice guidelines. Yes, there's a cost for this, but the guidelines provide a tremendous resource. An important suggestion to practitioners is that you don't, acquire this knowledge and skill in a moment, in in one episode of reading or learning. And so my suggestion is to find peers or mentors, um, form, you know, a journal club in which you read journal articles together on effective interventions and the research that supplies the evidence. Find a mentor who can help guide you, who may be knowledgeable about your practice setting and your client clusters. Find a partner. In some way, enhance your learning by not trying to do it solo. Engage with colleagues um, to help yourself. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Liz, for outlining that 
process of applying evidence to best practice and uh, giving such great guidance to to me and and to our listeners um, who who really want to do this more in in practice. Uh, so, what additional resources, uh, if any, would you recommend to our listeners? Okay, um, so I've mentioned some of the more formal resources that our audience can utilize. My first recommendation is explore what offerings are provided at state and national OT conferences. Frequently sessions are presented on implementing evidence-based interventions for best practice. You may also find some local presentations where some of your colleagues are presenting you know, best practice suggestions. These are great resources because you're with other colleagues, other OT practitioners, and you can gain much from listening and asking questions. There are two OT texts that I think are beneficial. They're both published by F.A. Davis. Um, The first one is The Evidence-Based Practitioner Applying Research to Meet Client Needs by Katana Brown. The second text I'd like to suggest is titled Occupational Therapy in Community and Population Health Practice by Marjorie Scaffa and Maggie Ritzt. The text as a whole offers you understanding of how the strategies of designing occupational therapy services or a program of services can be done in many different settings. Absolutely. Thank you. And again, we'll have those resources available in the episode description for our listeners who want to look into them. Um, Liz, now we're on to our, our very last question, a segment I like to call the golden nugget segment. If you could share one piece of advice or one recommendation with OT practitioners, what would you say? I, I think I've talked about my golden nugget already. So the golden nugget is you're not alone. Learning about implementing evidence-based practice is a large undertaking, regardless of where you're starting. The critical thing is, as practitioners, you really do not need to go and do a major literature and find all of the individual research studies and their findings for a particular intervention type. Certainly, you're welcome to do that. I'm not saying never do it, but practitioners don't need to start at that step. The purpose of the systematic reviews and the publication of the practice guidelines is to provide practitioners with a resource that has already conducted those literature searches and analysis of the findings from research studies. You're not alone. AOTA has provided many resources for you. And so whether you're doing reading on your own or you're partnering or collaborating with colleagues or working with a mentor, use the resources that are there. And so you're not alone. And it's not a one-shot process. It's a learning process that every practitioner should be engaged in regardless of experience or regardless of knowledge, regardless of the many years that I've been in practice, I am still taking in information about what do we know today that's effective because science grows, knowledge grows, and hence our evidence for what are effective intervention grows. So you're not alone, partner up with somebody and use the resources that are there. Thank you, Liz. I, I love that nugget. Um, it's such a positive and encouraging note to end on. Uh, thank you again for being on the show. Uh, we really appreciate your time being with us today. It's been my pleasure. Thanks for listening to Everyday Evidence. Tune in next time for more evidence-based practice insights and applications.